time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Cecil Carnes, foreign correspondent and outstanding author. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mrs. Claire Booth Luce, former United States representative from Connecticut. Mrs. Luce, you of course are one of the most distinguished women in America, and I'm sure that our viewers will welcome your expressions tonight on the political campaign. Now, first of all, you are known as one of the very early supporters of General Eisenhower. I wonder if, since the beginning of the campaign, uh, you have suffered any disappointments or disillusionments in the manner in which General Eisenhower has conducted his campaign. Well, Mr. Huey, I've suffered no disillusionments about this campaign. Uh, because I have no illusions about political campaigns. I've been uh, through four presidential campaigns, and one sees that both candidates inevitably are drawn by the diversified nature of their support to compromise a little. This is true always of both candidates. I felt that uh, General Eisenhower has made no more compromises uh, than is necessary uh, to pull all the divergent elements of one great party together. Mr. Stevenson has done the same thing. For new voters, this is disillusioning. But for people who understand politics, it's the nature of our two-party system. Before we move on to the next question, I think I should call our viewers' attention to that very attractive Eisenhower decoration you're wearing. Oh, that. I got that in, in, in Chicago. And I've just been out in Illinois and in Indiana campaigning. Well, coming back, another question or so on the Eisenhower campaign. Do you think that General Eisenhower has now done an effective job of uniting the, the Republicans and all the protest group in America? I think he has a larger measure of support uh, from his own party than any candidate has had in 20 years, plus the fact that he also has many independents and many Democrats now uniting behind him uh, because of his program and policy, but even more so, perhaps, uh, because of the character, the wisdom, the experience, and the courage of the man in a time of do crisis. You, do you feel that the defection of a man like Senator Morse has uh, damaged his campaign seriously? Well, I think that the defection of Senator Morse is no more or less damaging uh, to uh, the Republicans than the defection and loss of Senator Byrd or um, Governor Burns or many other Democrats who have been coming out like Lou Douglas and uh, many another prominent Democrat has been coming out uh, for Ike. Now I think that both parties do suffer these losses. I do not consider that the loss of Wayne Morris is going to play a decisive part in the <laughs> campaign. Mrs. Lewis, this year, American women will cast more votes than men. Do you feel that General Eisenhower has an especial appeal to the women of America? Well, you know, uh, Mr. Carnes, there's a great dispute been going on for a good many years as to whether women were more intelligent than men. Now, it'll be very interesting to see what the women do in this election because they have more votes to cast than the men. All the surveys and polls show that the women are going to prove that they're more intelligent than the men because more women are uh, in the surveys voting for Eisenhower. Well, now, why men. do you think that more women will vote for General Eisenhower? Well, I think because uh, women have a a uh, better instinct about character. They are not uh, so concerned at a 
a mental level with the issues, but they are very concerned with what kind of a man, what kind of character he has. And I know that women instinctively feel enormous trust uh, in Eisenhower's capacity to lead them and their nation and their families uh, to a better, a better America. Will he appeal to their minds as well as, as to their intuition? Well, of course, yes, because women are also in interested in the issues. Uh, you On know Korea, for instance, do you think women are particularly interested in an issue like Korea? I think it would be hard to say that a father is less interested in what happens to his son uh, than a mother. But in a way, that is true. And I do think the women are more concerned by the fact that we've had 19,000 of our boys killed and 90,000 wounded and there's uh, 13,000 missing of our boys only seven years after World War II. We're already in World War II and a half. And I think the women are alarmed when they discover uh, that the president, by his own admission, has no plan, no plan, no plan at all for ending the Korean War. In fact, from all the president says, and Mr. Stevenson, you get the impression that they're sort of going to stabilize this war for an indefinite period. And I think women feel uh, that Eisenhower can well, uh, bring how, this war to an honorable end. How, how do you feel on that issue, uh, Mrs. Luce? Uh, uh, just recently now, General Eisenhower has made the rather dramatic announcement that if elected, he would go to Korea, personally try to do something about it. Do you feel that General Eisenhower would have a better chance of ending the Korean War honorably? Well, you know, uh, President Roosevelt during the war traveled extensively. He went to North Africa and uh, he went uh, out into the Pacific and so on during the war. So it's not unusual uh, that an elected president would go into a war area. Uh, the difference is uh, I think that Eisenhower, as a president and commander-in-chief, uh, going to Korea uh, would understand what he was looking at, hearing, evaluating uh, better because he has uh, been a great modern uh, soldier. Do you think so that I think it would be very helpful to the nation. Oh, very, very. Do you think that the combination of a great field commander and the power of the presidency combined in one man might give us the answer to some of these problems? Uh, well, you know, the terrible question of our times is, is war two and a half going to turn into war, World War Three? And I am quite sure that General Eisenhower's experience of war and of handling uh, national leaders uh, in times of war will be invaluable uh, in preventing it. Oh, you know a lot of people say that because he's a soldier, uh, he'd be interested in having a war, but did you ever hear of a fireman that wanted to start a fire? We've had Ms. nine presidents who were generals, and there's never been a war under one of them. Mrs. Lewis, I'm sure that our viewers would be disappointed if they didn't hear you talk about the other side a little bit. Now, uh, what about uh, the president in this campaign and Mr. Atchison, the president first? Why, wh what do you think of his role in the, in the present campaign? Well, I think you know it comes uh, very strangely uh, from Mr. Truman to criticize the language of McCarthy, for example, the smear, the vilification, the character assassination when he himself has been really indulging in some pretty low blows. I think this is most unfortunate. Now, the professional democratic politicians tell me, yes, but this gets votes. I don't think somehow uh, that the American people really like that kind of campaigning, not anyway. Uh, when it is being done uh, by a man who is not seeking to protect himself or get into office, but just being done uh, to show uh, that 
this man, General Eisenhower, couldn't refuse to win, uh, to run on the Democratic ticket as he did and get elected. Uh, because Truman, uh, hell hath no fury like a Truman scorned. <laughs> uh, well, now, what about the Secretary of State? Do you think he's an important issue in this campaign? I think he is so important an issue uh, that the counter barrage, the smokescreen of McCarthyism has been uh, set up to hide the terrible issue of Acheson from the public. Dean Acheson's foreign policies were directly responsible for the loss of China, the handing over of China to the communists, and for the fact that our boys are now fighting these very people in Korea. I think that when history writes the record of appeasement, the loss of a hundred million people a year behind the Iron Curtain, the loss in treasure and in blood to uh, to our people that we have suffered under Dean Acheson, it will be a very black book in history. And the Democrats don't want us to turn the pages of that black record. And that is why they are making so much about the loud mouth and the smear campaigns of uh, McCarthy to hide that issue. Understand, I don't deny that McCarthy is using the language he uses. I just say that the attention which he is being given is in order to protect Mr. Dean Acheson from criticism. Well, I'm, I'm sure that our viewers have very much appreciated these views tonight, Mrs. Luce, and thank you for being with us. It's been a very great pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Huey. And Mr. The opinions Brown. of heard our speakers expressed tonight are entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Cecil Carnes. Our distinguished guest was Mrs. Claire Booth Luce, former United States representative from Connecticut. Coast to coast, the football season is in full swing. And coast to coast this year, as for years past, the football games of more than 125 leading colleges and universities are timed by Longines, the most honored watch in the world of sport. Yes, the games of Princeton, Dartmouth, Harvard, California, Texas A&M, Georgia Tech, and over a hundred more are timed by Longines watches. And field judges, umpires, and observers of the National Football League also use Longines watches exclusively for official timing. The reason? Accuracy, not as an empty claim, but demonstrated time after time, year after year, in competitive accuracy trials at great government observatories. Yes, for greater accuracy, for beauty, for the promise of a long and useful life. Throughout the world, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. Premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight. Reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Make your election headquarters the CBS Television Network.